Hi, I'm Chet Marchwinski at the Lean Enterprise Institute, and I'm joined today by Rich Sheridan. He is the CEO, founder, and chief storyteller of Menlo Innovations, a software development firm with a unique and very successful approach to building a culture that's based on learning and continuous improvement. So, Rich, glad to have you here. Welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. One of the things about uh, Menlo, you set out to create a culture of joy, and you were very uh, distinct and said, it's a joyful culture, not a happy culture. Right. So what's the difference and why is the, the, uh, the distinction important? Sure. Yeah, um, if we think about happiness, happiness is often momentary in our lives, and uh, there's certainly happiness at Menlo. There's no question where, where we, are, we have happy moments, but joy is a much longer-term outcome. Uh, joy, as I describe in the book, is uh, if any of us have raised children, uh, when uh, my daughter got married, my wife was digging her fingernails into my arm as uh, my daughter was saying I do to the man of her dreams. Uh, we were reflecting on a lifetime that in that moment we realized we'd accomplished a, a significant joyful outcome with our oldest daughter. And yet we all know raising children that it's not a happy time the entire time. Uh, there's always struggles. There's always work that has to be done. There are things that we have to focus on that aren't the easiest things to do. And this is certainly true in software design and development. If we want to, if we want to create joy for the people we're trying to serve, it's hard work. And so we can't. It would almost be unnatural to be happy the entire time we do this. But with that joyful goal in mind, uh, we can we can tough through the hard times. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the specifics of the culture. For instance, uh, lean management, and you guys don't use the, you have your own terminology, mm -hmm. uh, you don't use lean or Six Sigma or such, but there's, um, you, lean puts this emphasis on uh, everybody learning continuously using a, a scientific cycle, plan, do, check, act. And it seems like mental health has, has been able to create a similar learning culture, a continuous improvement culture. I was just wondering, <coughs> excuse me, what tangible activities do you do that uh, create that culture? How do, how do you actually make that happen? Yeah, um, <clears throat> when I introduce people to our culture and I speak to the joy and the joyful outcomes we're trying to produce, I say, look, we can't produce joy in the world without having joy in the room. There's just no question, there has to be joy in the room. Uh, and the first thing I talk about in order to keep ourselves in a learning mode, I believe the role of leadership is, and it has to start with me as a founder and CEO of the company, is one of my biggest jobs is to systematically pump fear out of the room. Because if we can pump enough fear out of the room, and I'm not talking about the things we should all be afraid of. We shouldn't walk out in the street and not look both ways before crossing and that sort of thing. About the type of fear that many of us learn during our sort of managerial mentorship where we learn to motivate with fear. And I can tell you, especially in a company like mine, but I believe this is true everywhere now, that uh, manufacturing fear in order to motivate actually demotivates a team. If we can pump enough fear out of the room, people feel safe. If they feel safe, they begin to trust one another, they begin to collaborate and now all of a sudden teamwork emerges and then you start getting the things everybody wants from a learning corporation, from a learning organization. Creativity, innovation, invention, imagination, and human energy. And a lot of what we do focuses on that from a cultural mindset and the specific things we do, the structures we use at Menlo accomplish that goal. For example, one of the things we do is we remove all human, all barriers to human communication. So if you walk into the room, we have one of those open office environments that everybody vilifies in the press now. There are no cubes, office, offices, walls, doors. I sit out right in the room with everybody else. The space is flexible and it's noisy and they're all together in the room and the team has total control over the space. So they can form the space however they choose. And so there are no facilities people, there's no permission to ask. And simply by giving them that leeway to make the space work exactly the way they want it to begins to open up a whole other set of possibilities. And that's just one example of some of the things we do at Menlo to encourage that learning environment. 
Now, you mentioned the uh, feeling safe, and you make a distinction between feeling safe and, and being safe. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that, the sure. difference between two cultures? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I know for me and a lot of my corporate life and a lot of organizations that I'm introduced to, you can sense right away that it is typically a being safe kind of culture. That is, I'm not going to raise my hand, I'm not going to stick my head up too high, keep low, uh, be careful, be politically correct inside of the context of our organization, uh, cater to the boss, uh, make sure I'm getting my raise, I'm going to get a good review this year. All of those things are usually driven by fear and it drives everyone to strive simply to be safe, watch your back, CYA, all the kind of things that are standard in most, most corporate cultures. We focus on making sure people when they're at work feel safe. And if they feel safe when they're at work, if we create the environment where they feel safe, that's when that trust and collaboration and teamwork and invention begin to emanate. Um, the waste of motion is one that uh, has been uh, mentioned in, oh, from the, the first time that Toyota production system was uh, formulated. There was, those, there were seven wastes, and waste of motion was one of them. You've mentioned that uh, at Menlo you have waste of motion, and you've come up with a way that you, you call it high-speed voice technology yes. as a way of eliminating that. So could you give us an example, what does waste of motion look like at Menlo, and how does high-speed voice technology act as a countermeasure? Yeah, so uh, you know, I often uh, toy with people in a, an audience that I'm speaking to. I say, how many of you in the audience uh, have meetings in your culture? And of course, every hand goes up. And, um, uh, and I say, well, we've pretty much eliminated meetings at Menlo. Uh, we think they're mind-numbing, spirit-sucking, energy-draining <laughs> devices of management. And then I tell them, you know, ask me later what I really think. Uh, and so if we want to call a meeting at Menlo, we don't use electronics to do so. We use what we like to call high-speed voice technology. And the way we do it is because we're in a big open room, if I want to call an all-company meeting with the team, if you wanted to call an all-company meeting with my team, you would simply call out in a fairly loud voice to get their attention, hey, Menlo, and they will respond immediately. If it was me calling it, they would say, hey, Rich, and then the whole place goes quiet, and we're now in a meeting, all-company meeting. Nobody moved. Okay, and I would conduct the, the, uh, the meeting, I would say, hey, we just landed a new deal today. I just wanted to let you know. They might cheer. They might ask me who's it with, what's it for, and all that sort of thing. And then I say, thank you. Meeting completes. Most of our all-company meetings, 45 seconds. No one moves, right? Imagine, you know, a typical company, all-company meeting of any size or an all-department meeting or something like that. It's, you know, book the conference room, send out the CC all emails, have everybody coordinating calendars, mm -hmm. the the ten minute meeting dance just to get the meeting started. And then we get some coffee or Yeah, so exactly. Before, Check yeah, an yeah, email yeah. and that sort of thing. Oh look, not everybody's in the room yet. I'll go I'll go talk to Chet down the hall or something. And so but at Menlo, hey Menlo, the meeting, everybody goes quiet, transact the business, get done, thank them, back to work eliminate the waste of excessive motion with hardware that was pre-installed at birth. <laughs> <laughs> Vocal <you're> cords, <laughs> you know, body language and eyebrows. So uh, it's uh, far more effective. When we communicate internally inside of Menlo, we don't use electronics. We use high-speed voice technology. Even though you're a technology company? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Well, mm -hmm. we think this is very high-tech right. vocal cords, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Developed over millions of years. And it works. <laughs> and it works, yeah. There's another element of uh, lean management called uh, go and see. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, I don't think you call it that at, uh, at Menlo, but uh, you've got a, a very unique way of doing it. And you actually do go and see, go and verify or observe a problem uh, or a condition yes. uh, personally. Uh, and you use it with, um, I believe the job title is a uh, high-tech anthropologist, yes. which is kind of unusual. <laughs> but uh, tell us about that because it's pretty unique but effective. Yeah, and our high-tech anthropology practice cuts to the heart of the joy we're trying to achieve in the world with what we do. See, what our focus is, is external to the organization. It is to delight the people for whom the software we're designing and building is intended. People we will probably never meet in particular and people who will never pay us for what we do. We are trying to delight the users of the software we're trying to create. Well, in order to do that, we have to understand their lives, not just 
their workflow, not just their process, but understand them as human beings. So our high-tech anthropologists literally go out of the office, out into the world, and observe the people, examples of the people we're trying to serve, and observe them in their native environment. Learn their their goals as human beings. Uh, learn their their language. You know, every every industry has its own lingo, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And my industry certainly does, right? You know, and and it's amazing how much we obfuscate um, uh, capabilities through language, right? And, you know, I, we were working on a diesel motor diagnostic tool once, and uh, uh, our team had conceived that uh, the, the right way to begin the process of diagnosing a diesel motor vehicle was to push the start button on the display of this device we're designing. And they took it out into the world and showed it to a guy that would ultimately be the type of person who would use this, and we just handed it to him. We didn't tell him what to do. We just said, hey, what if you were going to do an initial diagnostic test with a tool that looked like this? And he froze. He just looked at the screen. And we asked him, we said, what were you looking for? And he says, well, I'm looking for a button called test. We said, oh, we call it start. And he says, oh, no, in my world, if I press a button called start that's plugged into a port under the dashboard, it would start the engine. I would never press that button. But thinking just that simple example of going out into the world and observing somebody who's actually going to do the work, what an improvement that is. Because remember, we are the industry that gave you, if you want to shut down your computer, please press the start button. How intuitive is that? Or the ever-intuitive control-alt-delete. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I like to, our, our mission statement since the beginning of Menlo is to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology. <laughs> and there's that. plenty of it out there. And our high-tech anthropologists want to serve the people who are ultimately going to use the work. That we create. And if they didn't do that, they would have gone down a wrong path. There probably would have been a delay in the project once that user got to got to use it. So it was very important to go see right in the beginning. Yeah, and and I will say that you know I lament that we have gotten to the point in our industry where we refer to the typical people we're trying to serve as stupid users, and then we write dummies books for them. <laughs> And it doesn't have to be that way. I can tell you it's not stupid users, it's stupid design. And if we can improve the design process by understanding the people we're trying to serve, which is what our high-tech anthropologists do, we can create software that doesn't need user manuals, doesn't need help text, and doesn't need training classes. There's, um, let's take it in, uh, another step. There's, uh, we were just talking about the high-tech anthropologists and the, the, the go-see philosophy that, that uh, kind of starts to build in quality into, in, into your software. Now, what about the, uh, the, the programmers? Mm -hmm. uh, do they use checklists or those typical, you know, how do they build in quality sure. once they start working? Yeah, so a unique aspect of Menlo, and it's true of our programmers, it's true of our anthropologists, and it's true of the QA team we have, is we work in pairs. So two people, one computer, all day long, working on the same task at the same time, sharing the keyboard back and forth, collaborating on the code they're building. Now, I can tell you, uh, for most people who aren't in our industry, and heck, most of them there are in our industry, what I've just described is unimaginable. They have two programmers sitting together, sharing a keyboard, and co-developing the code. And what happens is, if I type in a line and you and I are paired together, I type in a line of code and you point to the screen and say, hey Rich, I'm curious, why did you choose to do it that way? And I look at it and say, oh, you're right, Th that's not going to work. Boy, that was a good catch. How did you catch that? And you're like, Rich, I didn't catch anything. I just asked you why you did it like that. Um, and I, and I'm, now I'm going to venture off into an area of which I have almost no knowledge at all. I had somebody in the room who was watching this who was very familiar with Six Sigma. And he said, oh, you've moved source and inspection to the exact same moment. I type, you're there, you look at it. You're literally inspecting my work at the source it's created. And, and I believe, and you guys probably can teach me about this, that one of the goals of Six Sigma is to bring together as close as possible in a production process the source where the error could occur and the inspection as to when you're going to find it. He looked at this and said, wow, in your pairing, you're doing that right there. Now, their strategy in writing the code is also interesting. The first thing we do is we create a test. 
before, a test harness, a test jig. Before we write the code, we create the test, and then we write the code and fit the code into the test. And then we automate all the tests so that every test we've created is run several times a day for the life of that project. So uh, we revere the tests at least as much as we revere the code. And our programmers can't even self-declare they think they're done unless all of the tests pass, not just the new ones they wrote. But when they say, we think we're done, they have to have run all of the tests ahead of time. We have one project where we have over 30,000 of these automated tests. And if you and I just make a few line change to the code and fit our new code into the overall system, we have to run all 30,000 tests. It takes about 10 minutes to run these. And they all have to pass 100% before you and I can say, we think we're done. In uh, the LEI book, Lean Product and Process Development, you, uh, there's a, uh, a case study about Menlo. Mm -hmm. And I, that's a part of it. And I think it's important to point out that that's not usually the way it works in software with no. testing. It's, no. And you guys do it right from the start. We do. And, you know, and the, and, uh, you know Jeffrey Liker said this about us. He, he said, and, I, and this is true, he said, any piece you find at Menlo, you will find somewhere else. It's not like any piece of Menlo is unique. So this technique is not unique to Menlo. It's still rare. Uh, what Jeff said was that you won't find all the pieces working together in any place like you're finding them at Menlo, so I appreciate that commentary. But yes, uh, these things are well understood. They've been talked about for over a decade, uh, and uh, they are still rare in our industry, even though they produce phenomenal results. And I mentioned lean product and process development, but I also want to tell folks that, uh, and you mentioned, you alluded to it before about uh, your book, Joy Inc., um, a lot more detail uh, about uh, what Richard's been talking about is in the book, and it's a great read too. It's uh, Thank you. I mean, you can really tear through it in a little bit, and it's good information. Um, I just wanted to uh, finish up with a, a final question. You're going to do a plenary session at the uh, 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 Lean Transformation Summit in March, and I just wanted to can you give us a sneak peek sure. uh, about what, what you're going to talk about in that plenary? Yeah, well, probably no surprise, I'm going to speak about joy. And I'm, going to, and I'm going to tell a little bit of my personal history because I think a lot of people are curious and say, where did this come from? Did you just wake up one day and <laughs> dream this up in this crazy process we use at Menlo? And the answer is, of course not. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how did I get here because I think a lot of people who go to a conference like this, are, they're looking for some inspiration. They're looking for some practical takeaways. I think they're also looking for real stories that they can relate to and say, hey, I'm in the spot he was in at this part of his career. How did he get out of that? What what personal things did he do and what techniques did he use? So I'll, I'll shed some light on my own personal transformation and what that, how that led to changes in a team I used to lead when I was vice president and how that all informed how we put Menlo together and what the results were. And then I'll dive into some very specific things that are just fun stories to tell about Menlo, I'll talk a little bit about pairing, I'll talk about high-tech anthropology, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Richard, can't wait to hear it. Uh, March 4 and 5, uh, 2015 in New Orleans. Um, thanks a lot for stopping by. You bet. I'm looking forward to it. We'll see you in New Orleans. 